Welcome or welcome back to the company of a cat. Hi, how are you? Another archetype video today. I'm gonna talk about the magical woman archetype in the novels and in general. The magical helper maiden is a common archetype in mythology and literature. It is the trope where a woman with mystical abilities aids the hero in their journey or quest. She often possesses unique gifts or knowledge that prove to be crucial in overcoming obstacles and achieving the ultimate goal. The helper maiden may also act as a guide, mentor or love interest for the hero. This archetype represents the power of femininity and the idea that strength can come from unexpected sources. The magical helper maiden may also embody the concept of transformation for the hero and herself. She helps the hero to overcome their limitations and become their true self as she herself also underwent the transformation to achieve this level of power. While the magical helper maiden archetype is often associated with positive traits such as wisdom and guidance, there are instances where they can be portrayed as cruel or evil. One reason for this is that the helper maiden is often depicted as possessing powerful magical abilities which can be used for both good and evil purposes. In some stories, the helper maiden may be used the magic to manipulate or harm others, either to help the hero or as a means of achieving their own ends. Additionally, the helper maiden may be portrayed as using their magical abilities to enact revenge on those who have wronged them, regardless of the consequences. Another reason is the relationship with the hero. In some stories, the helper maiden may become jealous or jealous. <laughs> jealous? Je je <laughs> I don't like this word. Or resentful. Either because they feel um, overlooked or undervalued, or because they feel that the hero has become too arrogant without him recognizing the very important role they played in their success. This can lead these characters to turn against the hero either by withholding their aid or by actively working to undermine them. The character is often portrayed as more important than the actual heroes in mythology and literature. Firstly, they're often the ones who provide the hero with their magical aid, or guidance necessary to achieve their goals. In many cases, the hero would not be able to succeed without their help. This is particularly true in stories where the hero is inexperienced or lacking in certain skills, and the helper maiden provides the necessary knowledge or tools. Secondly, they often embody qualities and traits that the hero lacks. They're more intelligent, cunning, or spiritually attuned than the hero, and thus are able to provide valuable insights or assistance that the hero cannot provide for himself. Examples of this archetype can be found in many cultures and stories, such as Midia in Argonautica or Morgana in the Arthurian legend, and also Merlin. Merlin was a wise and powerful sorcerer who served as an advisor to King Arthur. One of Merlin's defining traits is his intelligence and foresight. He was known for his ability to see into the future and predict events which allowed him to guide Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table in their quest to protect the realm. Merlin was also highly educated and possessed vast knowledge in many areas, from astronomy and astrology to medicine and magic. He is portrayed as one of the most powerful sorcerers in Arthurian mythology, capable of performing great feats of magic and transforming himself and others into different forms. Merlin's magic is often used to protect and aid Arthur, but it can also be unpredictable and dangerous, leading to unintended consequences. Merlin's relationship with Arthur is also a significant aspect of his character. He is his mentor and guide, providing him with advice and counsel on matters of state and warfare. However, Merlin's loyalty to Arthur is not unwavering, and he is known to have conflicting uh, allegiances at times. There are also some portrayals of Merlin that suggest he may not be entirely good. One of the reasons for this is that Merlin's own motivations and actions are not clear. He is a powerful figure who seems to have his own agenda, and his actions sometimes could be seen as manipulative or even creepy. <laughs> Media is another very famous embodiment of that archetype, and I have talked a little bit about her in my video about the similarities between the Argonauts and the Ironborn of old. The character of Media is a classic example of the magic helper maiden archetype, a powerful sorceress who used her magic to help Yason, the hero of the Argonauts, in his quest for the Golden Fleece. She was even willing to do cruel and immoral things to help him. She is portrayed as a powerful and intelligent woman who is adept at using her magic to achieve her goals. At the same time, Midia is also a tragic figure driven to commit horrific acts of violence due to her love for Yason and the pain he caused her when he betrayed her and understated all the help she had provided. Because, as I said before, dude, Yason was useless without her. The only more useful person's last thing than Midia in Argonautica was the actual boat. <laughs> and this is where the complexity of these characters comes in. No one can dismiss the horrendous acts Midia committed. 
For fuck's sake, she cut her brother up and scattered the pieces just to delay her father, and later killed her own children, even though she did it so they wouldn't be captured or punished for her previous actions, she still killed them in cold blood. Thing is, even though Yason calls Mithia most hateful to God and men, the fact that Mithia received some divine assistance, such as the chariot from Ilios, and the fact that she did not face direct punishment from the gods for her actions, indicates that she has the gods on her side. At the same time, we see that Yason, who had previously enjoyed the support of the gods, ultimately falls out of favor with them, due to his treatment of Mithia. On top of that, many times the crew and Yason were along with Midia very much responsible for many atrocities committed during the quest, and all these events happened because Yason wanted the throne of Yolkos. And this is something we see very often in the series too. We see many heroes in songs and legends, and all of them had a magical woman by their side. We even have one in the current timeline, Stannis. Stannis' storyline depends heavily on Melisandre. Without her, he wouldn't be at the wall or aware of the others, and honestly, even if someone sent word to him about magical ice demons from the north, I doubt he would believe them if not for Melisandre. Stannis is the fandom's boy, he's our lad, and we can fully understand his motives and beliefs, but from an outsider's perspective, Stannis is Bloodstone reborn and Mel is his tiger woman. Bloodstone is said to have killed his sister, the Amethyst Empress, he also practiced torture, dark arts and necromancy, he enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his wife, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods of Giti to worship a black stone that fell from the sky. From the casual Westeros' perspective, Stannis killed Renly, had a witch, and treated her as he treats his wife. He cast down the seven, burned septs and statues of the gods, and worships a new god that demands sacrifices, something that he provides quite often. With the way the stories become more embellished with time, in the future, they would say that he did other cruel stuff that he maybe didn't do. Or due to his zeal to do the right thing and save the world, like Melisandre is pushing him to do, he will indeed do cruel and unspeakable things. And even though Mel is not a character I'm very fond of, it's clear that she wants to save humanity. Problem is that she's a fanatic to the point she doesn't even consider that maybe someone else has a better solution. Or that war and fire aren't actually better than ice and death, just the other side of the same coin. In her mind, Rolor cares about humanity, therefore she cares about humanity because she cares about Rolor. But I think that she would put first whatever her dogma says, regardless of what that is, and ultimately it is not really humanity she cares about. She is 100% sold on her religion, because this is what saved her. Melisandre was a slave, and the only reason she escaped this life and has power herself now is Rolor. So she would do whatever to spread the world of the Red God that can save everyone, and consequences don't matter because for her, this is the right thing to do. And that brings me to the Bloodstone Emperor. The legend says that he became emperor by killing and usurping his sister, and that the demons from the east came because of his actions. But how do we know they didn't have some weird-ass prophecy about the demons coming, as everyone else has apparently, and tried to stop it? The prophecy of Aegon says that the savior would come from his blood. How do we know that the Tiger Woman and Bloodstone didn't have a vision about the savior being from his line? Bloodstone has some similarities to Azor Ahai, and Stannis is called Azor Ahai, but he is also a Bloodstone figure. Azor Ahai is a hero, so maybe in Yiti Bloodstone was evil, but in Asai wasn't. Like Stannis, who some people believe is the true king and others think he is a traitor, trying to take the throne by force and enslave his people. We often associate Euron with Bloodstone, and it makes sense they have many similarities, but they have a very important difference. Bloodstone, like Melisandre and Stannis, was devout. He even established a religion while Euron is anything but. And since I referenced Aegon before, he also had assistance. Visenya. Visenya was the one that did the dirty work. Visenya was sent to deal with the more difficult areas like Kraklo and the Vale. Visenya was committed to fulfilling the prophecy and thus to making Maegor the king, since he was for sure Aegon's kid. At the same time, Visenya is also a Bloodstone figure, the jealous and always angry sibling who some people blame for Aegon's death. And to be honest, I am of the belief that Visenya was the one with the dream and not Aegon. She was the one that was focused on magic and on making the sun with the right blood the king. And in every story we have, it's the magical helper that has the foresight, not the hero. Merlin had visions, 
Media had visions. Mel has them, Thoros has them, and Alice had them. So I really think Visenya was the one with the dream and she was obsessed with making her son king. The same applies to the Night's King. Here we are told specifically that a woman was his downfall. He fell in love with her, but the whole story sounds like the guy was Stannis and his queen was a nice Melisandre kind of witch. We even have the scene at the wall where Stannis is holding his sword with Mel on his side, but on his other side is Val, the blonde wildling beauty who wears white from head to toe. Night King, before his marriage, was described as a fearless warrior and was also the Lord Commander. This gives the impression that he was held in high regard before this union. He was the one that chased her, but also she was the one close to the wall, like Mel went to Stannis. After this meeting, he declared himself king and started to do whatever the hell they did in Nightford. So for some reason, she convinced him to become a king. And let's not forget that the, he gave his seed and his soul as well, gives Shadow Baby vibes, making again a parallel to Stannis' situation. What is the difference between making sacrifices to the others and to the lore? Nothing really. Neither is very benevolent, I would say. But at the same time, we do not know what exactly happened. What if the lady had visions and said, hey, if we give sacrifices to them, like Raster does now, they will leave us alone. I don't know, all the stories are very muddled and grey and everybody does messed up stuff in the name of the greater good, so maybe the Night King and Bloodstone did the same. Not that I agree, I have talked about it before, I don't believe in Jesus figures and the soul saviour, but in their mind they are correct. Another character with a magical woman is Clarence Crab, a hero from Cracklaw Point. According to legend, his castle Whispers got its name for the whispering heads of Clarence's victims. Whenever Clarence would kill a man, including lords, wizards, knights, pirates and kings, he would cut off their head and bring it back to his castle to his wife, a wood witch. There she would kiss the, the head and bring it back to life. The heads would then talk to each other and give Clarence counsel, creating the whispering sound. First of all, I doubt Sir Crab would have been such a successful hero without his witch wife, since she was the one that created his counsel, and secondly, I doubt that he had a good reputation in other areas. The things they say his wife did for him sound ominous as fuck. We see again a controversial hero that in Cracklow and to his family maybe was great and protected them from the squishers and other attacks, but I doubt people from other places in the Crownlands were very fond of him or his wife, since we know that among the heads he had a Duskendale king. Same with Duran and Elenai. According to legend, Duran won the love of Elenai, the daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. I doubt Elenai was indeed of divine descent, but since magical people were considered literal children of the gods, I'd say that she was magical. After all, she is the one that saved Duran when everyone else died at his wedding. The god's wrath was terrible to behold, destroying Duran's keep on his wedding night and killing all his family and guests. King Duran continued building larger and more powerful keeps after its one got destroyed until finally the seventh castle, Storm's End, stayed in place and resisted the storms of Shipbreaker Bay. The castle is considered magical. Some believe this is because the children of the forest helped build it. Others believe that Bran the Builder advised Duran on its construction, but the truth of the matter is unknown. Considering that he had a divine wife that saved him from death when everybody else died at that wedding, Maybe it was the magical wife that helped with the castle? Just dropping an idea here, because Duran didn't have the best relationship with the children of the forest, he took rainwood from them, and in the legend, if Bran was there, he was still a boy. He did have a wife that saved his ass though, at least one, if not more, since six castles were destroyed, not just one. House Durandon was a very powerful house. The Storm's King one ruled most of the eastern half of Westeros, an area reaching from Cape Wrath to the Bay of Crabs, and nothing would have happened if Elenai wasn't in love with Duran and didn't save his life. His whole legacy and the house's legacy exist because of Elenai. Same for House Tarly. Herdon of the Horn and Harlon the Hunter were legendary twin sons of Garth Greenhand and ancestors of House Tarly. They built the castle atop Horn Hill and took to wife the beautiful wood witch who dwelt there, sharing her favours for a hundred years. The brothers did not age so long as they had intercourse with her whenever the wound was full. 
And this sounds dangerously close to the blood magic stuff Serenay, Sierra and Alice Rivers were doing to stay young and beautiful. We do not know anything about them. We are told stories of Garth's kids and things they did themselves. But Herdon and Harlon were known because they were canoodling with a witch that kept them young. The house's history and reputation began because of her, which is very ironic considering how sexist Randil is. Another example, in my opinion at least, I'm dropping a theory here, is Hugo of the Hill and his wife. The wife was given to him by the gods, like Midia was a gift from Hrodite to Yason, according to him, which was not the case, obviously, and in the end it beat him in the ass, because this is what you get for being a cocky idiot. I doubt the girl was given to him by the gods, though, but if she was magical, it makes sense to say she was. The Andals have the most sexist culture in Westeros, as far as we know. I have talked about it in the archetypes we see in the faith, so by saying the woman was given to him by the gods makes Hugo seem like the hero and the chosen one. But considering that he had visions about Westeros after the gods gave him the woman, I think she was the one with the vision. Because as I said before, the helper more often than not is the one with foresight, not the hero. We see it in the story of Aemon and Alice too. Who told you where to find me? My lady. She saw you in a storm cloud, in a mountain pool at dusk. In the fire we lit to cook our suppers. She sees much and more, my Alice. Alice was the one that helped Aemon find Daemon, and after his death, she ruled Harrenhal as a witch queen, according to the stories. The question always is, are they benevolent or not? And the answer is no and yes. All these magical helpers, in A Song of Ice and Fire and all the other stories, are always very complex characters. In the novels, they are kind of outcasts, or were outcasts at some point, Melisandre was a slave, wood witches do not have the best reputation as we see, and many of these women were wood witches. Alice was also a bastard, Visenya was considered cruel, but it's not like she did that much worse things than Aegon, for example. And the tiger woman sounds like a skin changer, and we know from Jojen that people were afraid of them and called them beasts. In a world like this, these women had power and they took advantage of it. Most people would. On the other hand, it seems like at least some of them had the mindset of Mel, meaning that to achieve the greater good, the ends justify the means. Which is not a good thought process. <laughs> Another very important thing is that these women have influence. The hero is there, yes, but the main idea is theirs. Stannis wouldn't think of himself as the chosen one if Melisandre didn't say he was. The Night's King met the woman, and then he decided to become a king. It is heavily hinted that she came up with a plan. And we see this with many non-magical women too. They come up with the plans and the people around them still don't take them into consideration. Often not even the readers give them much thought. Catelyn had a huge role in their war. Mel has a huge role. From the way Jane and Rob came to meet and marry, it looks like it was planned all along by her mother Sibel. And if this is the case, Jane went along with the plan. Women feud with each other as much as men do and after the doings, although not flashy or obvious, do have a huge impact on the story. Olena is the best and the most obvious example, of course. Sansa, I think, will be moving toward this path and Dani is already there. <laughs> Sansa, after all the shit she went through, I'm pretty sure will understand that sometimes you need to be cold and quick in your plans and actions. Waiting and observing or going with the flow is not always the best idea. At some point, you need to use the power you have and use some amount of violence. Danny has already realized this. Talking with the slavers didn't lead anywhere. Actually, the opposite happened. They started to take advantage of this. She has done harsh things. Nobody can deny that, but she did it to people that crucified kids just to show their power to her. Negotiation wasn't on the table. She herself was a slave bride for as long as Drogo was alive and without her dragons. She didn't have power. But now she has and she tries her best. Will she do other cruel things in the future? Yes and no. It depends on how you view things. People in Westeros already think of her as crazy and cruel, even though she released slaves and the people she showed no mercy to were slavers. They were the worst possible human beings and deserved punishment. Same with Volantis. I personally believe she will burn the city and many people would see this as bad and evil. But the slaves are already waiting for her. They don't care whether they die or not. Death is better than the life they have in their eyes. 
Danny has both the role of the helper and the hero, so she doesn't have the benefit of being forgiven for her actions that many, mostly male, heroes have. She doesn't have a scapegoat. The hero does as many cruel things as the helper, and they are as responsible for these actions as the helper is. But usually, the helper is the one that takes all the blame. Danny doesn't have this advantage since she is both. And in my opinion, Sansa will start to act like this very soon, and good for her. Both these characters need to show no mercy to pieces of shit that take advantage of others. In a universe like this, as long as the people are not innocent, some level of brutality is sadly necessary. This is it for this video, I hope you had fun watching. If you did, press a like, comment and tune in for the next one, which is gonna be predictions and talking about Valyrian steel blades in general. Until next time, bye!